to. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to fit a, a multi-layer perceptron, so a fully connected radio activations. Uh, the definition is up here if you guys want to want to check out how to how to build one. Uh, you can check it out later. And then we're going to fit it. 30% uh, is going to be used for testing. This uh, shows up later in the paper, but uh, so we're going to use 30% for testing and then 70% for training. And uh, just because the data set is very small, we're going to enforce that the balance of the classes is maintained in the training and the test set. Otherwise, we end up with very poor conditions for testing. Uh, okay, so, so let's train that classifier, and that shouldn't take very long. Okay, we're fixing the classifier. Uh, moment of truth. Okay, so that fitted. It's a very small data set, so uh, it's very quick. So we got precision recall and F score. Uh, let's see what's the precision. Uh, so precision is fairly all right for all three classes. Uh, to the recall. Again, recall is fairly all right for all the classes. And of course, if they are all right, then the F1 score is also going to be uh, fairly okay for the class, okay? So, uh, there is room for improvement, but I think that we can agree that it's a, it's a good classifier. It's an okay classifier. And uh, it, is going, it is giving us uh, proper, uh, some, some good uh, results. So the question is, uh, is it well calibrated as well as having good accuracy? And uh, so the way we're gonna do that is, uh, I'm gonna use scikit-learn, it, it uh, comes from called calibration curve. And what calibration curve does is exactly what I explained before. So it takes all your predictions, so all your softmax outputs that said 0.8, and it puts them in one bin, and then it calculates how many of those examples uh, were actually correctly classified. And it produces a curve. Uh, we're gonna see it in a second, but it produces a curve where you can see the calibration. Okay, so let's do it for the first. So this is for the first class. Uh, yeah, so the first class is called Satosa, but uh, so this is what you would call perfect calibration, okay? Which means that you predicted 0.8 and actually 80% were actually in the right, uh, in the, it were actually correctly classified, yes? Do we know how many data points are in each bucket? Uh, we can know, but uh, I don't know it at this point. Because, because here it might be, if you have a good classifier, right, there, there might not yes. be many, many points in the middle. Yes. So, so, that, uh, so actually, the ideal case scenario where you have a perfect classifier and perfectly calibrated, you have one point here. So it's 100% accuracy and it's always right. Make sense? So yeah, one other interesting thing to look in these curves is how much support you have in each of the classes. So ideally, you want to avoid this zone down here because it's your low confidence zone and uh, be right of here, which is your high confidence uh, Potentially zone. also cross-calculated, cross, cr uh, cross right? Uh, yeah. Because it's a very small data set. Yes, it's a very small data set. So the idea is that if you, if you like the code, just take it and apply it on your data. And uh, it should work the same, and you should get more interesting results possible. So same, very high F1 score. But this region is telling you that your classifier is being underconfident, right? So you have, uh, you're saying, okay, it's going to be around 60%, uh, but actually 100% were correctly classified. So this is not a proper probability estimation, right? When your classifier says there's a 60% chance of this example being right, actually all of them were right. And uh, same here, this is, uh, so this is what you call the low confidence area. Let's see if it shows up in the, in the next one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so here is the low confidence area, so your, uh, low confidence. So your classifier said, okay, there's about a 30% chance, this is your high confidence area, so you were overconfident about your prediction. So your classifier said there's a 30% chance, uh, so you're fairly certain, but actually only about 10% were correctly classified. So if you have points down here, it's very bad because you're being very confident. Uh, about your estimate, and it's not actually true. Uh, and uh, for the last class, uh, okay, it looks, so 
So this is a perfectly calibrated point, which is good. But again, it's not perfectly calibrated everywhere. Uh, so this happens uh, with modern neural networks. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, just with the binning, how does that work? So just take an average of your predictions in that bin. Ah, and so that. depending on how much data you have, you can make the bins uh, smaller. Yeah. Here, because there's not much data, there's only five bins. Yeah. But you can tune that parameter depending on how many data points and you it have. Just averages your predictions within that bin. Yes. Okay. Actually, there's a good so, point. How, how thin is this point? Five probability point, yeah. It could be almost like in a, a point four thinning as well, and then it, it might not actually be so bad of a point. So. Could be, yeah. yeah. So uh, to get proper calibration curves, you, you need a lot of data so that your classifier gives you a <coughs> wide enough range of results. Uh, otherwise, you get very sparse data. But it serves to illustrate the point, and uh, I can assure you that this happens with even uh, with, when you have more data these curves start looking very, very funky. So it is nothing like a properly calibrated classifier. Okay? Um, yes? Good. Maybe in two weeks I can present a paper where they argue that it is actually straight. Uh, what is actually straight? So for neural networks, it should actually be rather, rather straight. Uh, well, it depends on your data as well, right? Yeah, probably. Uh, but the question is, can we make this into a proper classifier? Uh, well, the paper that we're presenting next week shows that modern neural networks are not uh, properly calibrated either. So, anyway, but so the question is, how do we make it a uh, properly calibrated classifier? And uh, this is what the paper uh, goes about. So it starts with all the explanation about support vector machines. Uh, but the question, so the the answer comes from an observation of the data, or at least this answer came from an observation of the data, which is that. Uh, the data that they were uh, trying to classify uh, actually uh, followed some sort of exponential uh, shape. Okay, so it is not Gaussian, but it can be described as an exponential shape. And uh, the question is, how do you uh, create a CDF for an exponential, and it's by using a sigmoid function. So that would be your cumulative density function, and. Uh, this should uh, reproduce a probability density function that looks uh, exponential. Uh, so the question is, what do we do? Do we change our classifier so that it actually starts fitting the right data? And uh, what they argue is that, that there is a much easier way to do that. And it's by putting an extra layer. So the, the ideal question is, can we make it so that uh, and we, okay, can we make it so that we can predict the actual probability of the class given our inputs? So that is the, that is the, the base problem. Okay? What, the, what the paper argues is that since uh, our classifiers are already proportional to the, log, uh, to the log probabilities, because that is what we are trying to optimize, then we can put another fitting layer on top which says, okay, these scores that you're giving me, these scores uh, here are actually not actual probabilities, but they are proportional to actual probabilities. And we can do uh, sigmoid fitting uh, on top of that. Uh, so you do something like this. Uh, you say, okay, let's say we have our function f. Well, can I now find the probability of the class being positive, so probability of y equals 1, 